In this session, I'll be talking to you about the transport mechanisms across the cell membrane. This is something which you will be learning in physiology also. But however, in biochemistry, this is a part of the syllabus. And though there is an overlap between physiology and biochemistry, I'll be talking to you about the transports across the cell membrane from a biochemical perspective. Now, why do we need transports across the cell membrane? Mainly because it's a lipid bilayer and some things which have to cross the lipid bilayer may not be it may not be possible for those things to cross the bilayer for which, which substances for example the water soluble substances they cannot cross across a lipid barrier so we need a transport system so what determines which of these substances can cross the membrane it all depends upon their polarity the charge the size and their solubility in lipids. It tells whether a substance can cross the lipid membrane or cannot cross. So as you can see in this slide, the transport systems can be passive or active. Now the passive transport system means that they do not require energy. Active transport system means that they require energy. The passive transport system are further, there are three different types, simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and ion channels. I'll be talking to about each of these separately. To start with, simple diffusion. What do you mean by simple diffusion? First and foremost, it is a passive transport. That means it does not require ATP. So without the use of energy, substances move across the membrane. So what sort of substances can move and what drives this movement? So, simple diffusion across the lipid membrane it all depends upon the concentration gradient. It is the concentration gradient which drives the movement across the membrane. So something which is more on one side of the membrane will simply diffuse across the membrane. This type of transport does not require energy. As I said, it is a passive transport. So how, how fast is it? The rate is very slow. Which of the substances can be transported like this? Usually substances like ethanol, alcohol, you know, ethanol, carbon dioxide, oxygen, gases, etc. are transported by simple diffusion. Basically, this moves from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. The next type of transport system is the facilitated diffusion. What do you mean by facilitated? Facilitated means you require something. You need someone to facilitate the movement. So what is required here? In facilitated diffusion, you require a carrier. A carrier is required to transport substance across the membrane. So what sort of uh, uh, facilitated, what sort of mechanisms are available for this? One, it, this is also a passive mechanism. There is no energy required here. And this can be bidirectional, but importantly, whenever you have got a facilitated transport like this, it means it all the rate of transport depends upon the number of carriers. So it means that facilitated transfusion can get saturated. So it is important that it also will have a V max, that is a maximum capacity that can be transported, the maximum number of solutes that can be transported across. Many times, whenever there is such a carrier, the substances which are similar also compete for the transport, for the same transport mechanism. Another thing is, there are different other types. This transport could be simple, pass through like this, or it can be a complicated mechanism, what we call the ping-pong mechanism. Now, in the ping-pong mechanism, the solute may bind to a carrier. When it binds to the carrier, it undergoes a conformational change. It changes its shape. When it changes its shape, the solute goes across the membrane. This type of mechanism is called as the ping-pong mechanism. This is very commonly seen in during glucose transporters. Now, this type of 
transport is also seen in a particular type of transporters called as aquaporins. Aquaporins are the ones which regulate the amount of water within the cell. They control the water content of the cells. They are important, very important in the collecting ducts of the renal tubules. Now, what is the importance of this type of facilitated diffusion? As you can see in this slide here, most importantly, nephrogenic diabetes insipidence. The, that is where the aquaporins are affected and it can lead to nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Many hormones regulate the number of carrier molecules. So again, we have insulin which regulates the glucose transport of four. It can increase the number of carrier molecules and thereby difficulties or disturbances in insulin, insulin can also lead to disturbances in glucose transport. The third type of transport that is there are the ion channels. Now the ion channels are specialized form of facilitated carrier mediated transport system. Specialized form. They are responsible for the transport of ions. They are all transmembrane channels. Ion channels are all transmembrane proteins which are help in the transport across the membrane. Now what is so special about it is these channels are gated. That means these channels can either be closed or opened depending upon certain stimuli. So in ion channels we have two types. The light and gated ion channels and the voltage gated ion channels. So what does it mean? It means that a ligand when it binds to the ion channel, the ion channel may open and it allows the passage of ions. Ions move across, charged particles can move across when a ligand bands. The voltage gated channels are what when there is a change in the membrane potential. When this changes, the ion channel can open and lead to an influx of ions across the membrane. So these are the two types, ligand gated channels and the voltage gated channels. So we will go further, we will look at this slide in which we talk about the ligand gated channels which are the different types. In the body, three important ligand gated channels are there, example, acetylcholine receptor. This is a very important ligand gated channel. It is present in the postsynaptic membranes. So binding of acetylcholine results in opening of the channel and influx of sodium ions into the channel. The second important ligand gated channel are, is the calcium channels. These are present in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. They open in response to stimuli to release calcium into the cytosome. The third important ligand gated channel are the amylogenin. These are present in the enamel of teeth. Again, they are responsible for the transport of calcium. We go further to the voltage gated channels and some examples. Most of the voltage gated channels are opened by depolarization of the membrane. Change in the membrane potential opens the channels. So, good example of this are the voltage gated sodium channels and the voltage gated potassium channels. They are mainly seen in nerve cells and are important for the conduction of nerve impulses. All these channels can be affected by different diseases and they are called as channelopathies. Now a few examples that you can see here are the Liddell syndrome where the sodium channels are affected, periodic paralysis where potassium channels are affected, there are other channel affected uh, diseases like cystic fibrosis where chloride channels are affected, there are so many of them where uh, myasthenia gravis where acetylcholine receptor may be affected, it goes on like that. Now we go on to, this is the passive transport where there was no use of energy for transport across the membrane. Now we will go on to the active transport. Active transport, the name suggests, name suggests that transport requires energy. Transport requires energy. So what gives it energy? Hydrolysis of ATP. 
nearly 40% of energy within the cell is used for the transport across the membrane. Most of the time, this is all unidirectional. It won't be bidirectional. ATP is hydrolyzed. Body doesn't want to unnecessarily use energy to transport in and out in both the direction. So it is very specific. These are very specific. These are all unidirectional transport mechanisms that are present within the cell. Most of these are specialized. This is also carrier mediated and they also require transporters to transport across the membrane. Now in this we have got two types. The primary active transporters and the secondary active transporters. So what is the difference between the two of them? In the first type, the primary active transport, in the primary tra active transport, the carrier itself is an ATPase. That means it itself is an enzyme or it has a capacity to hydrolyze ATP and drive the reaction forward. So this itself can hydrolyze ATP and drive the transport across. When, do, when does body use so much of energy to transport anything? Usually when it is against a concentration gradient. Concentration is low here, concentration is high here, but still the transport has to take place. That is when the body will utilize ATP and energy to transport across. These are type of channels where you have got a transport against a concentration gradient are called as ion pumps. Ion pumps are uh, the best examples for this type of primary active transport. So, and this type of transporters where which have got the capacity to hydrolyze ATP come under the category P type ATPs. They are also called as P type ATPs. So, we'll look at the different uh, uh, primary active transporters. The different examples. The first one is sodium potassium ATPase or the sodium pump. This ATPase, as the name indicates, has it has got ATP hydrolyzing capacity, and it is an integral membrane protein. It has binding sites for ATP and sodium on the inside of the membrane. Here it has got the binding sites for sodium and ATP. It has got the potassium binding sites are outside at the outside of the membrane. It pumps three sodiums to the outside and two potassium ions to the inside. So this is going against the concentration gradient. Now what is the clinical importance of this? There are certain cardiotonic drugs which utilize this facility, which help, uh, which act as competitive inhibitors of this transporter, of the, of the sodium potassium ATPase. For example, Oabin and Decoxin. The second example is the calcium ATPase or the calcium pump. The calcium pump regulates muscle contraction. That means it transports calcium out of the cytoplasm into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So what does that help? It helps in relaxation of the muscle. So what? This is required so that the muscle can receive the next signal. It is very important that the calcium has to go back into the sarcoplasm. So again, the movement here is against the concentration gradient. Cal the sarcoplasmic reticulum contains a lot of uh, calcium. Still, it has to go inside and that is why we have the calcium ATPase or the calcium pump. Now, another example is the proton pump. Now, this proton pump is very important in lowering the pH within the stomach. It is very important, especially in the stomach, but also important within any cell where we want to reduce the pH within the lysosome. As I said, the lysosome has to have very low pH so that the enzymes within the lysosome can be active. So because of this, to reduce the pH, we have a proton pump within the lysosomal membrane. And this pumps protons into the lysosome. One more important, as I said, the potassium proton ATPase in the stomach transports two protons and two potassiums and lowers the pH within the stomach. What is the clinical use of this? Why, why we should know about all this? Now in peptic ulcers, we use proton pump inhibitors. So when we use a proton pump inhibitor, it is basically inhibiting this type of pump and helps in 
decreasing the lower lowering lowering of the uh, ph that takes place during peptic ulcer now this is primary active transport we'll go further to the secondary active transport what is the difference between the two as i said here the transporter itself has atps activity in the secondary active transport it is not like that here it is, it requires the help of another substance which can act as the atps the transport takes place here but something else utilizes the energy the atp hydrolysis is done by some other this atp hydrolysis is done by another another uh, atps substance another substance so where does this takes place the secondary active transport one of the best examples is glucose transport now what happens is whenever glucose is getting absorbed in the gi tract into an enterocyte it is actually comes along with sodium it comes along with sodium into the into the enterocyte it is a transport of sodium across a membrane where the sodium concentration is more outside here and sodium concentration is less within the cell so it is a sodium concentration gradient which pulls glucose along with it this type of co transport where sodium and glucose come together is a type of secondary active now why do i call it secondary is this sodium cannot remain within the cell it has to go out so when it has to go out it uses another mechanism where hydrolysis of atp to adp and this is the sodium potassium atpase this sodium potassium atpase transports this sodium outside again for to repeat the cycle so what has happened here is when glucose has entered the cell effectively there is a hydrolysis of atp which is driving this whole absorption of glucose that is why it is called as the secondary active transport this transporter does not have the atp is activity it is another substance which is also required for the transport of glucose so this is known as a secondary active transport is it only for glucose no there are this type of mechanism is used for different substances like amino acids chloride ions iodine ions iron urate etc so all these type of transport of all these type of substances requires energy in a secondary manner the secondary active transport now i have talked to you about all this primary active secondary active passive transport uh, facilitated transport simple diffusion and all that now there is one more concept by which these transporters can be classified and that is called as uniport symport and antiport so i will tell you what is this uniport symport and antiport now if you look at this it is very simple uniport transports uni one so it transports only one substance so a transporter which can transport only one substance is called as a uniport so what is a symport a symport transports two substances just as the way we just saw in secondary active transport where sodium and glucose were transported i'll just show it as two different things so it transports two different substances the same transporter can transport two different substances at the same time and the third one is this is uniport this is symport and the third one is antiport antiport means when one substance is being transported in one direction another substance is being transported in the opposite direction this is called as different way of classification uniport symport and antiport 
Now, what are the examples for this? Uniport, example is glucose transporter. Symport, co-transport of two solutes in the same direction as I said, sodium dependent glucose transport. Antiport, two solutes or ions in opposite direction. Example, the sodium pump chloride bicarbonate exchange in the RBCs. So, these are the different types of mechanisms that are available in the cell. There is also the transport of macromolecules. For this, we have got the endocytosis and exocytosis, but uh, these are not so important. The cells, these are the ways by which cell absorb large molecules like by, by phagocytosis or pinocytosis. These are the different ways by which the cell takes up fluid takes up bacteria, takes up viruses. Uh, they are all energy and calcium requiring and uh, it results in the formation of a vesicle and takes up the molecule. Uh, exocytosis is just the way by which the cells release macromolecules into the surroundings. The fusion, they form whatever is synthesized within the cell like a, a protein molecule or a peptide. It is formed in a vesicle. The vesicles fuse with the membrane and it is released outside. And uh, this could be an example of insulin release, neurotransmitter release. So that is also a way by which transport across cell membrane takes place. So this is how different types of substances are transported across the cell membrane.